those of you that missed the previous two, our speaker is Professor Unter from EPFL, uh, worldwide known for his contributions to multi-resolution, wavelets, and lines that we'll be talking about today. So um, those of you that know Michael more personally know that he really likes lines, okay? I think it's hard to have conversations so without the lines coming up. So actually, I know for quite a few years, and I always hear about lines, so I'm really looking forward to talk today because I heard many reasons from you over the years, but I don't think I heard 10. So uh, we're going to announce them and make sure you actually get up to 10. So let me just take this opportunity, since it's the last lecture, to really thank uh, Professor Unsa for being with us. We've all very much enjoyed your talks. I think everybody here that came to the previous talks could uh, certify that. So thank you very much for coming. We had a good time. And uh, I hope you come back here. Well, first of all, thank you all of you for being here to, for, for this final uh, presentation. And also, really, uh, really thank you to Yonina and Arie, you know, for organizing uh, this. I mean, this for me, it's really a, a great experience. So, so I also enjoyed a lot the, inter uh, the intellectual interaction with, you know, that I had here. I'm, I'm really impressed about the place, you know, the Techno. I'm also very impressed by Israel because Arie was very nice to, uh, with me and also like showed me some good places and also Yonina and I'm really looking forward to coming back. <laughs> uh, we hope that we'll be open when you come back. But, uh. <laughs> yes, otherwise, uh, you know, there may be openings in EPF. <laughs> okay. So, uh, beyond the digital divide, 10 good reasons for using splines, and okay, I just put 10 because of time constraints, but I could have added many more. <coughs> so, uh, here's the outline, introduction. Then I, I, I'll present you a cardinal spine formalism that is a little more general than what I've so, uh, uh, discussed so far, and it's a sort like a distributional approach to uh, two splines, uh, which I think can lead to many generalization. And then I, I, I'll jump into those 10 plus good reasons, or I could have put in a dozen or, you know, I mean, any reasonable number. And and, and here, <laughs> oops, stop. Michael, it looks like 10 plus good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, once I, I, I put like pi square also, like <laughs> good reasons. <laughs> Uh, computational reasons, theoretical reasons, conceptual reasons, practical reasons, and you know, if time permits, uh, I'll give you a few examples in image processing. So uh, the digital device, or, uh, you know, that's uh, I would want it to be a little provocative, and so you could ask yourself, is continuous domain signal processing dead? And actually, you, I must confess that myself, you know, when I finished my PhD, I was convinced there was no need for all this continuous domain stuff, you know, like those integrals, but it's all sums anywhere, it's pixels or, or, or you know, samples stored in, in the <coughs> computer, and of course, not, I mean, at that time, there weren't so many digital cameras yet, but, okay, so you have digital cameras, digital pictures, and so you could say, okay, I mean, why, why do we care really about uh, continuous formulations here, because, uh, I mean, the modern world is discrete, the web, your cameras, <coughs> Uh, iPods, MP3, etc. Modern courses more uh, more concentrate on, on digital signal processing. Actually, we had a few conversations here. And, and if you look in computer science, uh, at least at EPFL, okay, they're not here, so I <laughs> criticize a little. They took away some courses in analysis. They took away the courses in system linear systems, and they, you know, they, so they, they only left with graph theories and and discrete mathematics, which of course are very important, but, uh, and, uh, and so most of this processing is discrete anyway, and, and then last, okay, students don't like the Laplace transform, so okay, we have to live with that, but, uh, okay, so, of course, uh, I mean, that's a very partial uh, fundamentalist <laughs> view of the world, and, you know, the real objects are, 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 are continuous, and of course, so if you look at your picture closer, you may see more interesting things. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and uh, so it's a Salvador Dali picture, very famous. Uh, so uh, often the end product is analog as well, okay? So, so and, and don't forget the interface, because, okay, the input is, you know, like continuous, and, and then, uh, uh, so we need a good way to translate and also a way to get out eventually. And last but not least, and I, I think I've 
hear many proponents here of that <laughs> motto here, or uh, many discrete algorithms require continuous time thinking. And, and for example, all the people who are doing those nice variational methods for image processing, the sampling theories here, etc. I, I mean, we, 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 we prefer to, to think uh, in the continuous world. Actually, I think continuous math are extremely powerful, and, 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 and so they can give you like close form solutions which are almost impossible to get in the discrete world. <coughs> so, okay, so wh wh what is here the framework? It's splines, and it could just be the definition of splines. The splines is the thing that allows you to convert the, the, <coughs> the continuous world into the discrete one and vice versa. So linking the discrete and the continuous and so, so spines are, are, are here. Is a spine function? So There's a piecewise polynomial function that, that goes through some points and with some continuity constraints. And as we saw, they can be represented using basis functions. There's also a link with wavelet that I'll bring out today. There's a uh, link with resolution. So that was sort of my <coughs> view of the field some years ago. But you know, as I got scratching my head, it became more like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to define Dobeshi wavelet as a spine, and I think I'm almost there, but a little something about convergence uh, missing. <coughs> so. so now, <coughs> about splines. Uh, so I've been very much involved in, in biomedical imaging, and, and there I must say, uh, okay, the spline methods I have quite found their way. And they weren't used too much, uh, you know, like may maybe more than 10 years ago, and, and now more and more they're, they're being, uh, you, you, you know, like used in state-of-the-art algorithm. And it's just a very general, uh, 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 I mean, tool. And, and so, for example, if you look at uh, tomographic reconstruction, there you're, you're taking like, uh, you know, measurements all over, uh, you, you know, like in a sort of polar corner system. So. So just you will have to interpolate to, to sort of put your, your data back on the Cartesian grid. And so you can almost think of any algorithm for doing a reconstru uh, tomographic reconstruction will require some form of interpolation. And so that's you know, one solution. <coughs> also uh, about sampling grid conversions, ultrasound is just natural in polar coordinates. You may have also uh, so, you know, MRI, different types of, 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 of case-based sampling, etc. Visualization, of course, you know, if you look at medical data, which is 3D, <coughs> you may, may want to resize, to rotate, etc. You may have like the stereoscopic uh, representation. Uh, rendering also requires, of course, interpolation. Geometrical cor correction, a lot in, in optics, but uh, also in MRI, because actually when you have distortions of the magnetic field, that, that will uh, translate in, into geometric distortions. Registration, that's a very uh, basic theme in, in medical imaging, because uh, you just need to correct for motion or overlay uh, data from different modalities. And finally, also feature detection, feature extraction. Of course, uh, let's say if you just want to compute a gradient of an image, it's better that you have a continuous uh, representation of that image. So here's the <coughs> cardinal spline formalism. So see my lack of Legos here. But here, uh, first, uh, we'll, we, I, I want to propose to you a distributional definition. In, 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 in my view, that's the most powerful one. Okay, and actually, it's very simple. A little strange the first time you see. It. So uh, the general concept of the L-spline, what we need is a differential operator, just to fix ideas, take a derivative. Then we have uh, delta Dirac distributions, and I'll give you a definition in multi-D. So we have multi-D Dirac. And so here's the, the, you know, like very, very simple definition. It says the following. The continuous domain function S of X, so X is varying over RD, is a cardinal spline if and only if this strange thing happens. Okay, you take a continuously defined function, you apply to it an, uh, a, an operator, and what comes out? A weighted uh, stream of Dirac's. And, and, and so actually for, for those of you teaching signal processing, it's a little strange here because this 
here is a sort of uh, the, the, you know, the analog representation of a discrete signal. So it has, has those Dirac's, which we think, okay, don't exist, but okay. <laughs> and we use them uh, for, 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 for the formulation. And so here you have a, a continuous domain signal. So it is really like an operator. It's not Shannon sampling theory. So it's an operator that will convert uh, the continuous object into a discrete one. And, and, and so those are the parameters, OK? And, and so this is the definition of the spline. So the spline goes with the operator. And, and what about the cardinal? Now, the cardinal has just to do with the position of the Dirac. Now, if you want it to be non-uniform, just put them wherever you want, and same definition, OK? So uh, if we leave like uh, those Dirac's <coughs> on the, uh, the Cartesian grid, we have a good framework for signal processing. And this is quite general, because the traditional splines here uh, are just correspond to derivatives. So you, you may think, oh, OK, this is a little weird here, but let's be concrete. So let's uh, go to piecewise constant splines, or something we have a good understanding for. So what would be the operator here? Is the derivative in the Fourier domain, <coughs> domain j omega. Now, again, I always like to associate the discrete version of the operator. So it's the uh, discrete derivative. So it's 1 minus 1 in the Fourier domain, this formula. And now, let's take a piecewise constant uh, signal here. Let's differentiate. Now, everywhere where it's constant, you get a 0. and Okay, when you have a jump there, okay, you, you need your Dirac. <coughs> and so the output here is, is given by, by this. So you have just Dirac's. What is the height of the Dirac? It's exactly the difference between two neighboring samples. And that corresponds to the, the finite difference of, of the signal. So, so it's, see, we have, uh, okay, so we have the operator here that, you know, like maps it into Dirac's. And, and now the discrete operator here even gives you the right weights. Yeah, so it's all like falling into place. But of, co of course, this is not the way anyone uh, or, let's say, computer scientist would <laughs> view a piecewise constant function. Right? It's, it looks like complete overkill. And the way you will prefer to look at them is as a linear combination here of shifted basis function, which are our Legos we saw in previous talks. And, and OK, the samples here being the weights, actually, it's, it's more stable also like to, to code in terms of the values rather than in terms of the differences. And now, OK, if you want to express now your B spine, which is the rectangle, look, I can express it here in terms of the operator. It's a derivative. So I'm taking the inverse of the operator, which is an integral. Remember, it's the step function. And then I'm trying to undo my integral. If I were just doing it completely, I would apply D. OK, I would get back to Dirac. But I'm not allowed to apply D because I'm a discrete guy. OK, so I'm only allowed to do something that would be close to D, which is taking this finite difference. So then by doing this operation, <coughs> I'm producing something that is sort of localized and, and which actually is a good basis function for representing spine. So, I mean, this is sort of this important realization. Actually, you can see it in the formula that you have the ratio in the Fourier domain between, you know, the, the poor man's version of the operator uh, 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 related to uh, the, 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 the true thing, which is the true derivative. So this, I must say, it took me many, many years to, 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 to finally li like uh, realize that. And, I mean, some people know, but uh, I mean, they won't tell you <laughs> usually. <laughs> OK, and, and, and it, it's, it's the basis for many generalizations. Yeah. So Michael, can I ask a question on the previous yeah. slide? Yeah, yeah, of course. So just in terms of notation, the um, delta plus is a discrete operator, right? Yes. No, no, but so uh, actually. It's operating on a continuous. Yeah, yeah OK. So, so I, can, I can define it uh, in the, the continuous domain. OK, I, I can define it as f of x minus f of x minus 1, of x minus 1. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and then if I were to define yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, because now it's operating on a continuous yeah, function, yeah, yeah. so it has to be. Yeah, yeah. So here I was a little sloppy. OK, but see, I'm, I'm still using those uh, round parentheses. <laughs> OK. So, so, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so then, OK, at least now you can be more general. OK, not just take derivatives, uh, consider uh, an, an arbitrary operator L, not quite arbitrary, okay, it should act 
like a derivative, it should have the node space also, to be really interesting. And so we can like formally describe our, our spine space by the objects. If we apply the operator L, we end up with Dirac. And, and then just to stay, stay on the ground, you know, like not to go way too far, <laughs> okay, we, we want like to make sure all that is, is in, in a finite energy. Now, okay, I, I think you, 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 you can like trust me that if you have such a, a definition, there exists some function phi of x, which is the equivalent of the rectangle, but that would go with the operator L. And this, actually there are many, many, but okay, it's maybe one that is the shortest that you may prefer, so that will call a generalized B-spline, and it will generate a risk basis for that space, and so that will be the way we will work computationally with this spline. So that's just the definition. Okay, so then, I mean, so we saw at least the twice already the risk basis, so I will not go too much in the details, but just saying here, okay, the object here is continuous, we can define a norm in the continuous domain, and we have the equivalence of norm of the coefficients here, which, you know, are, are and, and, uh, okay. And so those provide a one-to-one -one unique representation of the object. And then you get, you know, this more conventional representation, which you have seen already. So here you have the continuous domain signal is a linear combination of basis function and the, the coefficients now are the discrete representation. So continuous world here, discrete world here, and the link is provided by basis functions. Okay, so that's also the way, the way we like to, to, to view it, like if we're talking about wavelengths. Now, polynomial B splines, okay, so those are, you know, like uh, the prototypical ones. And uh, I, <coughs> I mean, they are in every talk, sorry for that, <laughs> but uh, you, you can uh, generate them by taking a re rectangle and uh, convolving with, with, with itself. And so, you know, the rectangle corresponds to the L, okay? And, 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 and therefore, I, I mean, you know, if you convolve uh, uh, a derivative with itself, okay, it's a second derivative, etc. So you get the ideas that those guys here will correspond to the n plus one derivative. Now, what are the key properties? So there are a uh, risk basis, and actually those functions are, I mean, are not random at all. They are the, s the shortest ones uh, that will be in the space of spines, and that's the reason why they, they are so good computationally. And for image processing, actually, what we prefer is to recenter them and, and uh, uh, so, so use, uh, use them like that. So that's the symmetric B splines. By the way, little parenthesis, how, how do you go to image processing? Because here it's 1D. Image processing, very easy. You will just take uh, tensor products. And uh, so uh, a B spline in X, a B spline in Y, a B spline in Z, a B spline in T, and, and you can go on. And, and, and actually, what would be the corresponding uh, operator, it would just be, okay, it's this partial de derivative, but it's, you know, the se separable version of, of the 1D operator. Now, the good news for image processing people is, as you may have noted, the B splines are like little Gaussians. Here's a cubic. And now, if you take, <coughs> you know, uh, a, a tensor product of Gaussian, it produces an isotropic function. And so, here, this tensor product is very much very close to being isotropic, so, so that's a good property. So therefore, I mean, you, 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 you don't feel really penalized by using such uh, tensor product uh, basis functions. And, and then you have like uh, this multi-dimensional representation. Here, the continuous object, uh, the, 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 the discrete representation of the signal, and here the basis function that, you know, like uh, make the connection. Okay, now what about my reasons for using splines? See here, I've been very open, okay? <laughs> so mathematical elegance, fast algorithm approximation theory, and then I have here a link with your favorite theory. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure I can deliver there, but uh, <laughs> sometimes it works, okay? So let's, let's just count them, okay? And, and, and we can add more. So one beautiful basis function. <laughs> so, uh, Okay, so the B splines are obtained by n, uh, n plus one fold convolution. Actually, there is a very pretty formula. I don't know if you appreciate, but try just to convolve. Uh, you know, like uh, uh, 
analytically to determine, you know, the end fold convolution of, of, a, of a rectangle. Ask that your students. And I think after three, you know, they quit, okay? <laughs> but uh, there's a very nice formula. So, so that's the general solution. So it's, uh, you know, finite difference, actually, see, always the finite difference comes back. N plus one, finite difference of X plus of N. What is X plus of N? X plus of N is the green function of the D N plus one derivative. So it's not at all a coincidence, this formula. And okay, there's a, a factor over here just for normalization purposes. Attractive properties for image processing. Compact support, shortest polynomial span of degree N. Symmetry, positivity, why is it positive? We're just convolving positive stuff, so it can only stay positive. Control smoothness, actually, when you start with the first one, it's, it's, it's discontinuous, okay? But the second one becomes continuous. Actually, it, you always integrate, okay? So they become smoother and smoother, so they have nth order uh, Hilder exponent. Uh, Bell-shaped, they look like Gaussians. In fact, uh, you, you just have the central limit theorem at work, so if you convolve anything with itself, sufficient number of time, it always goes to a Gaussian. And, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, the father of splines, okay, so, so just to make it clear, uh, it's a you know, very fine uh, mathematician, actually. You, 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 <laughs> you have read some of his works, okay? So, Freddy. Uh, so, Schoenberg, who, who, like, wrote this really, like, foundation paper on splines in 46, and, and, you know, already in his paper there, he had this very beautiful formula and all the arguments, uh, some of the arguments for, for using spots. Now, uh, two, we have fast digital filtering algorithm. And, and this is not so well known for, if you were to look for a book on splines in the, in the, in the library, that you will never find, okay? So that's the sort of the signal processing twist. Because they, they will have algorithms, but they're like numerical algorithms using matrices here. The good news is that all classical spline interpolation and approximation problems can be solved efficiently using recursive digital filtering. It's like with wavelets. Wavelets, you can do all wavelets with filter banks. Now, splines, you can do all splines with recursive filters. You know, the type you teach to your students. And, 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 and so that was uh, an interesting realization. So l let us look at the interpolation problem. So now, okay. What you have is a continuous object here. You want to find some coefficients, and you would like to find them such that your function goes to the, the points, to the dots. So you are imposing the condition that if I'm sampling <coughs> here, okay, I, 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 I should have an equality. And if you look at this equation, it's just a convolution in the discrete domain once I've sampled. I have the unknown coefficients, the sample version of the basis function, and now, Given f, I want to recover f. See, you, know, you all see it. It's a deconvolution problem. It's just a very simple, very well-posed deconvolution problem. So we, we, uh, we can solve it by inverse filtering. And so we can just define a, 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 a digital filter. Now, if, uh, in the, in the z-transform domain, it's very easy. It's 1 over you know, the uh, z-transform of a sample version of, of our basis function. Now, if the basis function is separable, good news. This digital filtering is separable. So you run it along the rows, the columns, the z's, the t's, etc., And it's, it's very easy. Now, uh, let me show you a concrete example because, I mean, this had not, uh, surprisingly not been noted in, in the spline uh, literature because there's more mathematicians or people doing computer graphics. And so they, they were not so interested in, in filters. But let's say, Take uh, your cubic spline, so here's an ex explicit uh, equation. You know, the way, if you were computing like a student, if you didn't know they shown that nice formula, so that's what you would get. So um, then you have your function, it's compactly supported, and you have just have those values, 4, 6, 1, 6, which are the integer samples. So now what you can do, you can now associate it with those non-zero values, you define a, a, a z-transform, and the filter then is 1 over that. It's the inverse filter, so that you can write like this. And then you say, OK, so here I am. I, I have my, uh, the, the uh, transfer function, and I would like to implement that. But now if you go and see the first reaction of the signal processor, it says, oh, this thing is unstable, OK? Because there's one root inside the unit circle, 
And because it's symmetric, is the other guy just outside? Okay, but I mean, before you try to implement, I mean, this thing has a, just corresponds to a, a, a symmetric exponential. And then who's, who said the world was causal? Certainly not images. So you can just do it. You do a causal filter, which is completely, actually, you factorize, okay? So there's a causal version. I mean, the first guy who's stable, so you implement the first guy who's stable causal. The, f the second guy is unstable when you are causal, but who told you you have to do causal, okay? So the second guy, you do anti-causal, and it's stable. So you can just, uh, so it's very fast, okay? It's two, two multiplies. And, and so that gives you fast algorithm. By the way, now you can take any problem, uh, like uh, in Debord's book uh, on, on spline interpolation, approximation, and so forth, which are sort of problems that we have linear solutions. And they all have solutions in terms of, of factorizations like that. You can even prove that the roots of that guy is always inside the unit circle. So that will always be stable. So, and uh, if you want to implement that, it's uh, 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 10 lines of C. Okay, and, and you just put a loop because you, you can factorize more terms if, if you have a higher order spots. Simple manipulation. So the spline family here is closed with respect to differentiation. I, and I think this is quite important also like practically for people doing image processing because you like to have differential operators, differential geometry, you need to co compute derivatives. So here, the I, I mean, the family is just designed for working with derivatives. So here again, the derivative operator, the finite difference operator, which is the poor man's uh, uh, operator, and guess how you know all this works together? It's, it's actually it's wonderful. Uh, if you take the nth derivative of a B spline, what do you get? Hey, this is a, a finite difference. Okay, so in fact, you know, like people, the first reaction, if you want to discretize, you know you know, differentiation or uh, operators, you would use finite differences, okay? There's not this sort of approximate. But here it's exact. It tells you, okay, you, 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 you apply a finite difference, but what you have to do, you have to change, adapt the basis function. And actually what happens with the order here is, or, or the degree is also very logical because polynomial splines are polynomials of degree n, if I differentiate the polynomial, I reduce the degree by one every time. And so here you have your expected reduction of degree. And here you have, you know what, you, you would intuitively tend to use the finite difference. But underneath, you still have uh, the basis function. So you have the discrete operator coming into play. And uh, OK, so the, uh, the basis function. And so you can just take your cubic spline if you differentiate once. Uh, you get that function. Uh, by the way, if you're an image processing guy and uh, you, you want it like to, to e estimate that uh, on the integers, okay, uh, surprisingly, not surprising by, at all, but what are the values? It's one half, zero, one half. Okay, so, so, so it so sort of coincides with your, you know, like, like your poor man's operator of a, you know, like central derivative. But, but here, I mean, it tells you also what happens in between. Now, if you differentiate once more, you get uh, piecewise linear, and just by applying this, this formula here. And actually, if you now take the values at the integer here, you also find, you know, like your, your sort of, you know, uh, one minus two, one values of the mask that you would associate with the second derivative. Now, link with system theory. And, and, and so this is a, a link uh, that's, in fact, it's, it's, it's the spline theory is really like a continuous to discrete uh, converter. And now here you just have to expand, a generalize a little, you have to consider the family of exponential B splines. And those are exactly the mathematical translation between the continuous time and discrete time uh, linear system theories. And actually this thing, I mean, this occurred to me as I was teaching, okay, like the very basic uh, signals and system course at EPFL. And uh, now, actually, the way it's organized, uh, you know, like I teach the first course, first semester is continuous because, you know, I'm convinced that you should still teach continuous. And then the second uh, semester is discrete. And actually, we even have it very, very parallel. So everything very parallel. So the first semester, 
you have differential equation circuits, analog filters, Laplace transform. We're talking about, uh, you know, like uh, filters, uh, uh, differential systems that are characterized by poles and zeros. You know, that's uh, you know very basic. And and then second semester, you teach. Uh, the different equations, the digital filters, the Z-transforms, and you have uh, you know, discrete filters. And then everything is very much parallel, and actually there's even like a mapping. You know, like if you have a filter here with some poles, there's this mapping Z equal E to the uh, power alpha here, where alpha is the pole in, in, in the uh, Laplace domain that would give you a pole that corresponds in the, in the discrete domain. And then you, you may ask, well, what is the link between both? I can guarantee you it's not Shannon. It's not Shannon. And actually, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the answer is <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost so, so, so trivial. You know, what do you do? You, you, you take the two things, you divide one by the other, and you're done. Actually, what I did, I had the, 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 the tables of all the, you know, like, basic uh, analog filters, and I had exactly the table that were organized uh, uh, for the discrete course, and I just took the two tables and I divided one by the other, and what comes out? It comes out these lines. Okay, because, uh, okay, here you have uh, uh, something, the continuous operator divided by the discrete operator, and, okay, for those who are interested, so there's uh, a reference here, but let, let me show you an example, maybe to what make it clear. What happens to the zeros? Oh yeah, okay. Uh, actually, the zeros we don't care. Uh, we, yeah, I could have put them, but they are not important uh, because uh, uh, they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't create any, any delocalization. Okay, uh, uh, but it's a good point. We, maybe we'll take it later. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, mean I, I, can, I can just. Uh, I, I like to keep the, the zeros in, in, in the, uh, in the uh, analog domain. So. Let's consider like the simplest uh, system, which is uh, you know, your first order differential system. Impulse response is the causal exponential. Uh, you know the, the Laplace transform is that. Now you have the discrete time counterpart, which is first order recursive filter. Here's the Z transform. We have just matched the, the time constants. And then, okay, you divide this by this. Okay, so what, what, and, and you do back the inverse Laplace transform. Okay, but that's not the way you should look at it. It's much simpler. It's the same trick as with the, uh, uh, you know, the integrator. Take this basis function, shift it by one, and just put it at the, the right height. And then what happens now, if you do the difference, miraculous. I mean, everything here disappears because it's exactly the same. And what you are left here is with a chopped off version of, of, of your exponential. By the way, if, if the time constant here, the alpha was zero, you would have a rectangle. So we know the uh, territory here, okay? And uh, now it is relatively easy to convince yourself that, you know, if you just stack up those little guys here, you can reconstruct. Uh, the exponential, and, and, and so this is to me <coughs> the key relation, okay? And it's always the same idea, okay? We have continuous domain here, we have discrete domain here, which would be both samples, and the link between both are some basis functions, and they are here, okay? So, so uh, and, 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 and that's it. And, and that, uh, uh, okay, so you may wonder maybe now what, what is happening there mathematically? For, for those who have some appreciation for harmonic analysis of Fourier domain, you know what happens here? It's that you have a pole. Now this function here in the Fourier domain, it's not continuous. I mean, that's this singularity, okay? And so therefore, if you do the inverse transform, I mean, it cannot have a uh, very fast decay, okay? Or, uh, you know, I mean, it cannot be very localized. Now, what, when we are dividing the two, you have pole zero conservation. And, and, and so this is sort of the miracle that produces uh, uh, something that is very localized. And also like to respond to Ari, you know, uh, this, this, this is, you know, the, the, the troublesome part are the poles, okay? So the, 
zero. Uh, we, they're still there, okay? Because we, I mean, they're in the basis function. Okay, we just put your zeros in the basis function. But the control theory, the zeros also play a very important. Yeah, so but I, I mean, I think you could, you, you could okay, get away with this. Okay. Okay. But does this like impulse invariance when you design filters? Take continuous like impulse response and then sample it. Yeah. Okay. So, so. Then so the frequency you should get all the shifts, right? And yeah, but uh, actually, actually, I mean, I mean, this maps into impulse invariance. But if you were, um, I, I, I mean, somehow not, not exactly, but actually in the paper, I, 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 I mean, I discussed that. Okay, because it suggests some generalization of impulse invariance. If you sample and in time, and then in frequency, you should get all the replicas, and somehow they cancel each other out. Because of the basis. Yeah. But, but uh, anyway, the take-home message is that uh, if you have any analog system, differential system, there's a basis function associated with this. Now, if you change them, okay, everyone has its B-spline, and, you know, I mean, guess what happens if you just convolve the B-splines, okay? So, <coughs> you, you have a, a very simple sort of, sort of calculus that, that is associated there. And I, I mean, you can do some things with it. I, I'm here just uh, showing you the, the, the basic uh, flavor. Okay, now we're at, uh, <laughs> I have to hurry up <laughs> for my, my 10 reasons. So we're at uh, reason four, uh, reason five, less cost performance trade-off. Polynomial splines have maximum order of approximation or minimum support. So, <coughs> uh, so, so very short, but uh, good, good uh, uh, approximation properties. And they have also a low asymptotic uh, uh, approximation concept which explains their superior performance in image uh, processing application. So this relates with something I was discussing in my first presentation. <coughs> Here uh, I'm just talking about, you know, like spaces corresponding to different samplings and of course you'd like to see how the error decays as you, you know, like make your sampling finer. And so we have this bound, kind of bound and you know that the rate of decay of the error determines the approximation power of the representation. And as I already indicated last time, splines have order of approximation n plus 1. And we have also a formula for, for the constants, you know, that involves the uh, zeta, uh, zeta, Riemann zeta function. And uh, let me show you that it works. Here is a is a, is a uh, okay, then my pet cat. Now what are we going to do to that poor cat? We are going to rotate it. And uh, so, so we are going to rotate it using different algorithms. So we are using linear interpolation. Here we're using cubic. And here we're using a window sink, which, uh, you know, naively we think it works well. And we're just going to, uh, to amplify the distortions by, you know, doing it many times. The best one wins. Okay. So here we are. So do you like linear? Okay, you have lost all the whiskers, all the small details. Uh, here I don't know what happened, but uh, it's typical artifacts because in fact you don't have reproduction of polynomials. Actually, it's very bad to, to just truncate a, a sink. And, and cubic works best. Okay, so, so here's the picture, but you can do that. And actually people have been, uh, others than us, okay, have been sort of trying to also like to verify, you know, we were claiming, yeah, spine works so well, so some didn't believe us, so one guy used, uh, considered 130 interpolators, and I mean, what he did, essentially the same type of experiments, okay, so, uh, and what we're trying to quantify is, is the speed, okay, and the speed depends on the size of the basis function, so here's speed, here, here is quality in terms of signal to noise ratio after you turned a few times. And here, okay, so we're, here we're all, all traditional type algorithms. And actually what you could also see, like the community had worked really hard and was kind of saturated here. They were just not using spines because they were insisting on having a function like sync that would be one at the origin and zero elsewhere. And of compact support. Now with spline you are violating <laughs> the rules, okay? And, <coughs> and so with splines, uh, you, 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 can, you can be better. Do you know, by the way, where the Lanchos interpolation stands? No, but, but so I, I actually, here, okay, so, so I put all interpolators who are, you know, in the form of a phi function, okay? So I, I don't know if as well as... Uh, Lanchos is simply a sink yeah. multiplied by a smaller sink 
pass down the Yeah, so, so I, I suppose, you know, I, I can tell you, if it does not reproduce polynomials, it, it, will, it will be very, uh, not too good in terms of signal-to-noise ratio. And with the same window, it's really hard. You, you have to scratch your head how, how to preserve polynomial. Maybe you can do the constant, but... You look slightly faster than what that is. Okay, yeah, so s just to see if you were <laughs> following. So you're always following. Okay, no, so so what we did here, uh, okay, so so uh, uh, there's an implementation, so that's real data. So, so we had just scratched every possible, you know, trick to have a fast uh, cubic spline by, you know, also in the formula how you compute the x cube, you know, to ma make as few operations as possible. And, and, of course, this guy should be here if it's not optimized, but, you know, you can still, like, uh, crunch out, uh, but that you could, can do for many of the other guys, okay? So perhaps you should reassign the, the, the cubic here. But, uh, well, I mean, then it, it sort of pays off now to spend your energy on one you think it works well and make it even faster. And, and higher order splines, they, they don't, don't smear, smear more... Uh, you, can, you, you, you always get improved quality. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I will respond to that in two seconds will be another, <laughs> another reason for using splines, okay? Uh, <laughs> link with wavelet theory. Polynomial B spline have remarkable dilation properties. They play a fundamental role in, in wavelet theory, so here just as a reminder, so, so the generalized Lego Duplo relation that we saw last day, okay, so that uh, if you have a you know, like a dilated basis function, you can re represent it as a sum of finer one, a weighted sum. And, and so, you know, for the B splines, you have the same type of relation just here, instead of 1, 1, you get the binomial coefficients, just that 1, 1 convolve with itself a certain number of time. And uh, so, so uh, okay, so they, 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 they generate like uh, uh, multi-resolutions, but what's more remarkable in, uh, in my view is the following. And so that's what we call the b spline factorization theorem. Now, you can take any scaling function, any function like Dobeshi, uh, Koiflets, uh, whatever, okay, has order of approximation gamma if and only <coughs> if it is a b spline convolved by something, okay? Now, I can even tell you that something is really not nice. Except, uh, uh, no, no, we have theorems, okay? So now the B spline part here, uh, it has all the regularity, the nice property, the fact that your wavelets are smooth. Everything comes from the B spline. This thing can only be a singular distribution. So the best case, if it's a Dirac, it can only be worse than a Dirac. Actually, I mean, think of that. Here is Dobishi, okay? Dobishi 1, this is a fractal. So how could you take this nice function and convolve it with something so to, you know, like create a fractal? Okay, so it's, we cannot draw it. <laughs> but we try to run the algorithm. <laughs> but I mean, it's something that's, that's really nasty. I mean, I mean, it's a fractal. It's not in L2. I mean, it, it's, it, it's terrible, okay? And it can only remove smoothness of the B-spline. So then you would say, why, 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 why don't we use this? Is there a legitimate question? No, there's one reason for that, and it's the only one. By putting this ugly beast in there, you can make them orthonormal. That's the only reason. All the others out. Okay? So, and uh, actually, so, uh, I mean, this was sort of uh, known, but actually this, this, this theorem is even true for fractional orders. And, and uh, for those who, who know, like, filter design, if you are doing uh, Dobeshi wavelets or, or, or any other wavelets, you should always have, like, 1 plus z to some power. Those are called the regularity factors. And those correspond to the vanishing moment. And, and then you have something else here. But if you remove that, just replace it by 1, you get this part. Okay, so the good stuff, or, I mean, okay. <laughs> Don't quote me too strong on that, but, uh, because I'll, I'll get in problems with Ingrid and other people. But, uh, uh, I mean, all the good properties are here, and actually it, it, is, it, it is quite fundamental, because 
those are sort of the uh, more sophisticated properties of wavelengths. Okay, so wavelengths you have multi-resolution, so you have uh, a rate of approximation, you know, at some at, at some um, rate here, and it is completely equivalent to having a uh, this spline hidden in the wavelet that has exactly the appropriate uh, approximation uh, 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 order. But a wavelet behaves like a derivative. Okay, it's completely equivalent of having the this spline that goes with the de derivative. It's all equivalences. Now, there are further equivalences here. This thing has to do with polynomial reproduction. And uh, you can only have polynomial reproduction if you have the B spine. So you can only have convergence, you know, in L2 sense if you have the B spine. The vanishing moments also can only have vanishing moments if you have the B spine hidden inside. And, and this one, you can only have smoothness if you have at least enough B spine so you, you can differentiate because all the rest is ugly. They're not allowed to differentiate. So you said that if I don't want conformality, <coughs> yeah. I only use this one? Yeah. I don't need wavelet at all. No, uh, I, I mean, uh, you, you need the spline. <laughs> okay, so, so now I mean, you still have all this idea of, uh, you know, like basis function for the difference between yeah, two resolutions. Yeah, I, I, and, and I've actually all the mathematical properties of wavelets okay. are inside of the this one. Link with regularization theory, so, so that's more like this you need that now. <laughs> uh, Spline estimators are optimal from a variational point of view. And uh, uh, so this is now the smoothing spline, or let's say the denoising problem, but it's a sort of linear denoising problem. So you, you have uh, a signal plus noise, and so you would like uh, to design an algorithm such as to fit the B spline, such you know that somehow it's uh, a reasonable fit of the signal, but maybe not perfect because there's noise. And then, okay, so then what you would be tempted to do to write down sort of regularization type formulation, you say, okay, you have a data term here, a quadratic, actually this data term here is really in the discrete domain, and you have a regularization, and here it makes sense to apply the regularization in the continuous domain because you, you are outputting a continuous uh, fit, and so here you'd like to put the derivative to penalize the oscillations, and now it turns out that the solution of this problem among all functions, now I'm not saying it's a spline anymore, just looking for the global optimum of that problem, it is a spline of order 2m minus 1. <coughs> so the m here. Okay? And, okay, in addition, you can use a little algorithm, okay, with the recursive stuff to, to compute the solution. So the theory, uh, I mean, this, this was known uh, to Schoenberg actually right from the start because it's the reason why he called them spline. Okay? And here's a true spline. The spline, uh, uh, the, it's a device that was, you know, pre-computer graphics. If people wanted to design nice cars or ships or whatever, so they had a kind of rod, and, and so they, they would like force it to go through some points, you know, like uh, it's the sampling points, and, and then the thing would just bend itself naturally, and, you know, if you use elasticity theory, it will bend itself such as to minimize the curvature, curvature second derivative, cubic spline. Link with channel sampling theory. So, so that's perhaps uh, the answer to you. Uh, you. You may think, hey, when you go higher and higher order spine, it gets worse and worse, okay? Because it starts ringing, uh, gets larger, etc. Uh, and, okay, uh, here, the Hilbert space formulation of polynomial spline approximation provides an extension of Shannon's classical sampling theorem. And actually, the thing is here. So if you look you know, at the equivalent impulse response of a spine interpolator, and how would you get it? You would have, like, your C to the power n plus 1, which is your B spine, but you need to correct by the interpolation filter. Now, if you plot those things, uh, so if you do the <coughs> first uh, uh, spine of uh, uh, degree 1, you get uh, just a thing square, okay? But as you go higher and higher and higher, what do you get? Hey, it looks more and more like an ideal filter. And actually, there's a theorem. As the spline increases to infinity, we get to sync. Okay, so that's the answer to your question. So, so, so everything you know about sync, okay, you can, you, 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 so, so if, 
if uh, the, the higher order supply will converge to sync. And I, I can even tell you, I, to my knowledge, it's the fastest way, computational way, of getting close to sync. But if you have edges in uh, space domain, yeah, yeah, so it has the same problem as sync, so it will win. So, so, it's be, so in this case, sh uh, short uh, small order plants might be better? Yeah, exactly. But so usually it's a matter of compromise. But let's say if you're only translating, you know, like SIP makes no error, you know, because it's completely shifting them. So, so, so it depends. For many so it's a, yeah, it, it, yeah, it depends what type of transformation you do. Okay, so there's a link with classical uh, uh, sampling theory here. Link with stochastic processes. So splines are in direct correspondence with stochastic processes, stationary of fractals that are solution of the same partial differential equation, but with a rather driving term. So that's uh, has sort of more like intrigued me in the last few years. And uh, the story is like that. It always goes with L, this operator L. So now what you can consider is like a differential equation. So you will have a driving term, R, and here you have the solution, S. And, and so that's your differential equation. Okay, so now the thing is, now by, by putting R's, like excitations, your differential equation, now I, I, can, I can generate all kinds of things. I can generate splines, I can generate stochastic processes, and they're all like ruled by the same equation. So, and, and the story is here. Let me just put the Dirac just to try out. So, okay, I put the Dirac here, so the solution is the green function. Let me put those guys, the Dirac's, with weights. By definition, this is a melt spline. It's just definition. Let me put white noise. Okay, why not? <coughs> Actually, a Dirac, yeah, I mean, it's the, just the, uh, the, the deterministic version of the white noise, so spectral is the same. So let me put white noise. What do I get? Uh, this generalized stochastic process. So, uh, and, and, and now the here was, was the funny part. Because now, the generalized stochastic process, now if I consider the, the exponential splines, which I just showed are uh, the link with system theory, now this maps in all the classical stuff. You know, all the continuous time stochastic process, uh, I mean stationary stochastic processes. Somehow it's simple. But now, the problem was, A, the polynomial splines, what do they map into? And, 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 and there the answer was fractals, okay, because, uh, or, or like Brownian motion, stuff like that. Not stationary stuff, but it is, has a very simple still uh, description, okay. Oops. Uh, and here, here is a warning. Uh, uh, there, I mean, once you go into the fractals, it becomes a... Uh, uh, dangerous mathematically because you know the derivative, okay, you, I'm saying that it's the integral, it's the inverse of the derivative, but you have boundary conditions, okay, so there's a non-empty no space, and I would say that all the difficulty of, of, of spine theory is, is here, you know, it's, 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 it's in, uh, you know, like the technicalities associated with boundary conditions, but uh, I mean, sometimes they, I mean, we, we, we just uh, don't see them and get a uh, uh, you know, around. And, and here just a, 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 an example to, to show you the concept. So now we can do it multidimensional. So there we are more interested like in Laplacian operators. But now we may want to consider fractional Laplacian operators. So the Laplacian, in, in, it's just the omega square. Okay, so we could use also non-integer powers of the Laplacian. Now here is fractional Brownian motion. Uh, usually referred to as one over omega something process, okay? But this is like in quotes because this thing is not stationary. So you're not really allowed to write the power spectrum because it, yeah, just one over omega is not integrable. Okay, so but, okay, you can still define, actually now the, the, the easy way for a single processing guy to define this beast, which here you don't know really what to write and actually I, I don't recommend you even look at the literature, it gives you headaches, okay? So, but if you apply the, uh, the Laplacian, you get white noise. It's easy, okay? So that's a very easy characterization. So those fractals are things that if I uh, differentiate them, I get white noise. 
And so this, this, this looks very s simple. It's an innovation model. And the difficulty is in going here. You know, it's like the integration. So here you have to put like good boundary conditions. And actually there, to make that clean, okay, uh, we had to, to go back to Gelfast's theory of generalized stochastic processes. And actually the, this was a very nice work developed in Russia that was relatively unknown. It's a sort of like very clean distributional formulation, stochastic processes that uh, I think deserves to be better known. And, and, and then by duality, you, you can like get very, I, I mean, it's mostly a, a question of formalization, okay? How, how can you, you know, make claims? How can I tell you that this is true, you know? And, 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 and then you need just need this formalism. And then it's a one-liner, okay, but you need to get the formula. Uh, and, and, and actually, this just maps into the deterministic counterpart, because here there are also splines associated with the Laplacian. Actually, those are classical splines. They're called polyharmonic splines. They're also known as radial basis functions. They're exactly those guys. Okay, so they are like sort of radial basis function splines. Now, if you uh, uh, go this way, ap apply uh, the Laplace operator, you will end up with Dirac. By the way, uh, radial basis function are just the, the green functions of the Laplace operator. So that's the connection. So link with estimation theory, splines are minimum mean square error estimators. And actually now, I, I think you're not too, too surprised, there's sort of this uh, parallel in, in, in the same equations, okay, between splines and stochastic processes. And, and, and therefore, you, you have also like spine provide minimum mean square error estimators, uh, hybrid Wiener filters for a corresponding class of stochastic processes, and either the stationary ones or the fractal ones. And actually, the story goes like that. So if we have this measurement model, so just the signal plus noise, now we assume now that our signal like would, would, would be a realization of a process that is whitened by L. Okay, so L, the operator now, is the whitening operator of the stochastic process, but this is a continuous domain uh, uh, stochastic process. Now, the noise here is, is discrete, okay? So we're just adding on the samples. Then, good news, uh, the spline corresponding to L. Actually, it's not L, it's now L star L. Okay, this sort of quadratic story here, so, so uh, this optimal estimator, then you have like the conditional mean given the noisy estimates, and it can be uh, computed by a function. And uh, also you have the optimal lambda for the smoothing spine problem, and the lambda is just proportional to the signal to noise ratio, which is, you know, sort of uh, to be expected in this type of problems. But uh, so that sort of uh, and, and okay, so now I'm 10, okay, <laughs> oops, <laughs> I'm, I'm over, uh, so, so I've been carried away as usual. Um, so I, I could add a few ones, actually it's an important slide I realize, uh, and I, 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 I would owe to Leonid and, and, and also to, to Arya, it's linked with, with, with control field. And that's a very uh, link actually that was also like there are a few papers, very old papers by Kaila who found the link. Yeah, oh, you found. Okay, uh, where, where you have like uh, 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 not, I was just like talking about uh, 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 time invariant operators, but you could also have time varying operators and you can do the whole story again, it's just, you know, uh, you don't get so nice formulas, but the concepts are all valid. And, and so you have a link with, with uh, control uh, and, and Kalman filtering and all that. Uh, so they, although more pragmatically, this uh, splines are very attractive Hilbert space framework for designing algorithms. Splines are patterns better than Zobeshi uh, that I had mentioned uh, shortly last time. Splines can be extended to fractional exponent. I had also shown you that. We even like got carried away <laughs> and made like a <laughs> fractal. Uh, complex uh, powers. Actually, Josh is not there, but by doing that, we were able to 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 make uh, uh, B splines that uh, behave like Gabor functions. Okay, so by by making complex exponents, uh, scale invariance and linguist fractals. So it was sort of <coughs> to mention. And then 
Okay, now, the regular splines go with the regular wavelengths. What do the non, you know, the exponential guys go with? And why the exponential, they go with other wavelengths that are as good, they have as fast algorithms. The only thing they don't have, they don't have the scaling relation. They have embedded spaces, etc. So, and, and that's sometimes also called stationary wavelengths, and, 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 and etc. So. Okay, so I think I, I almost have no, ca no time for, for the application examples. So let me just tell you, I mean, it can be used for many problems, sampling, interpolation, feature extraction also, uh, um, and uh, image matching uh, will go very fast here. So here, for example, you could just, uh, uh, a very mundane problem of rescaling an image, like in Photoshop. Uh, so you can just by interpolation, but why not doing it by projection, like you would prefer to do it if you were a Hilbert uh, space type of person, and you can do it. But uh, actually, it, it, it works really well in practice. So this is so an image, and we want to make it a little more using linear interpolation. So that's what you get. And when you, when you blow it up again and make the difference, that's what you're using. Now, what we can do, we can use exactly the same linear splice, but instead of doing interpolation, which is ideal sampling, now we do a projection, okay, uh, a square approximation, and we get that. It's the same basis function. Okay, so see, appreciate the difference here. It's 5 dB difference. And I didn't need to do it uh, 10 times to show it to you. Okay, so, so, so just to show that, uh, okay, it gives you a framework that you can sort of reformulate the uh, uh, image processing task. If you are interested in image processing, it also gives you a clean way to, to, to determine, you know, what type of operator. Should I use Zobel, uh, Pruitt, uh, you know, what, whatever. <coughs> <coughs> there it's just you choose your spline model, and then the spline model will spit out for you some masks. And actually, they're very nice because they will be isotropic. Okay? The, this will be very clean derivatives, but there is one difference with what people would do usually. Don't forget to put your spine fitting filter. There's the IIR filter here. Okay, but, and then put this IIR filter, you fit your cubic spine, and then you put this type of operators, and you can get Laplaces, gradients, and et cetera, and, and those will be really isotropic. Uh, okay, so that's, that was some years ago. So a brain uh, in resting state, no, uh, resting state under the effect of some drug, you yeah. have to, to align them. So no, that, that's just the registration. Let me, let me just show you a little. So that's actually some work we did recently. It's uh, quite good for biologists because they, they will like uh, look at my, uh, acquire my, uh, micrographs and, 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 and on a kind of mosaic. And so then when you overlay them, I mean, the corners are not you know, like, uh, I mean, it's hard to just position the microscope right, and so if you run a registration algorithm using high sp uh, good quality spines, so you get, uh, you know, like, uh, good, good, good results like that. Okay, so, so some other stuff. Okay, so I, I think I, I oh, oh, this is uh, the brain of uh, <laughs> one of my students. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we also measured the, this fractal exponent using uh, 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 you know, the spine wavelets, but uh, uh, here the problem was uh, it's for functional MRI, and so the, the, the we had like anatomical data and functional, uh, functional data, and because the magnet is not completely, I mean, the uh, magnetic field is not completely uniform, there is a, a, a not perfect overlap between the anatomy and, and, and the functional image, and the functional image is just warped slightly, but we don't know how. It depends, you know, on, uh, you know, on, on the uh, conditions. And so, therefore, the idea was here not only to use splines to do interpolation, but also to use splines to uh, estimate the deformation. And so, so we have an algorithm that, that we can pass. And so that's a deformation map, such as to minimize the error in the, in the multi-scale fashion. Okay, so so you get like essentially like uh, okay. okay, so conclusion. Uh, slides are attractive computationally. They're simple to manipulate, smooth, and well-behaved. They have fast algorithms. 
And this is a trademark. Here's order one per sample. It's kind of hard to, to beat. They have multi-resolution properties. Uh, you can do all these pyramids. They're you know, also kind of implicit if you're doing multi-grid. Actually, multi-grid sort of assumes they are splines, like linear splines, wavelets. Uh, splines provide you with a unified conceptual framework, approximation theory, the link with wavelets, signals, and system sampling, controls, stochastic processes, etc. And they, I, I think this is perhaps, you know, like more for practitioners, but I think it's a very practical Hilbert space framework. And I like to make the analogy of the splines like the finite elements that people would use for solving PDEs. Okay, because the PDE is, is formulated in the continuous domain, and you want a discrete algorithm, and you have all this finite element machinery that's very sophisticated, really powerful. And so here, I, I, I view it that we have the counterpart okay, for, for doing signal processing. I mean, in our case, it's simpler because we have like uh, Cartesian grids, etc. And so we, we have simpler algorithms because we, we can use recursive filters, etc. Et but I mean, I mean the, the idea is here that you can just transpose continuous into discrete. And, and then, you know, you can think analog, but digital. The toolbox are just filters, convolution operators. And it's flexible because depending on how much computation power you want to spend, you can either use zero degree spines. It's, it's, by the way, it's what people do often implicitly even you know, if you're doing not too fancy discretization or using like linear spines <coughs> or you, you, you can uh, use higher order ones and so acknowledgement so it's always the same kind of people Annette <laughs> and uh, a, f a few papers here uh, you know that uh, could like uh, if you're interested to, 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 to get a little more details and, and all this is available on the website. So thank you very much. Okay, so thank you for a wonderful uh, finale. Any short questions? Any long questions? <laughs> and you know, if you have uh, your, your own favorite theory, <laughs> you can still <laughs> fill in a, I need to add a few, a few more, what, uh, 11, 12, 13. Actually, I have a question, but okay, if people need to leave, because it's late, then feel free. So, when you do the sampling, when you go from the continuous time to the discrete time, so basically you're sampling in time, right? So in the Fourier domain, I should have all the frequency shifts. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how do they miraculously all cancel out, and it's just the math does it, or, I mean, what's the secret here? No, no, they're still there, but, uh, I, I mean, the, 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 the thing is, you, you, you don't really have to compute them, because... Uh, I mean, you, you, you have explicit formula that... Uh, no, so you're saying all the shifts, if I take the pole and take all the shifts, I would get one discrete pole? So you write the... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah. somehow all the shifts of that one continuous pole will give me yeah. one discrete pole. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, the discrete world is quite periodic anyway. Yeah, I know. Yeah, the yeah, fact yeah. that it goes to one pole is a surprising part, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, this is, this is where we can eventually have problems. Uh, like we, w when we were trying to design wavelets that go with that, and the only case where we had a problem is when we had poles that were pu purely imaginary, separated by two pi, <laughs> oh, okay. and then we couldn't day. do it yeah. anymore. Okay, yeah. so but, but uh, uh, otherwise you can always do it. But actually, uh, that was only for the wavelets. Uh, if you don't have wavelets, I mean, if you just want to do the the, the exponential spline, you can always do that. You can even do them when the the system is unstable because you chop off, you know, so it's, I mean, either the exponential may go up or down, but, I mean, the, the function is, is still, like, localized. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, any further uh, yeah, comments, if, questions? Yeah, if, if you have uh, not a, a, a L2 limits on derivatives, yeah. but uh, L1 and so on, you, you showed optimality of splines, uh, Ah, okay, so, wow, well, that's, that's a very, very interesting point. <coughs> and and there, there are some people who have looked at, uh, uh, you know, total variation type splines, because, uh, uh, I mean, here, L2, okay, the, you, can, you, you can do the math, okay? But, but uh, first of all, if you look at the regularization, you can put anything, no, at the data term, you can put anything you want, and you still get splines, because that's not the part that's so important. 
for the math, okay? The important part for the math is the regularization. So now you can only do the silver space stuff when it's you know, a two norm. Now if you put a one norm, and, and then you will get like total variation, there are results uh, where people have shown that the solution is a non-uniform spline, but they don't know where, where the knots are. So it's really intriguing. And I must say, I'm not at ease there, OK? And there is no constructive approach to it. Yeah, so, so they, I mean, in the paper, they kind of describe some way of, and actually has to do with convex optimization. And, and okay, to but, 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 but I, I mean, the problem is in the continuous domain, OK? So it's really weird, OK? So, so it's like if this L1 would bring in non-uniform. So, so, so that, uh, for me, it's... Uh, it's known that people uh, approximate with uh, non-uniform triangles uh, the surfaces, and it's a really good way of doing it. Yeah, and, and by the way... Think so, about if, similar, uh, so, by the way, if you put the derivative one, so the first derivative and one <coughs> norm, so that's total variation, and actually there, they say it would go to a spline that is piecewise constant, and, and actually it's what one observes also, you know, like, if, if you penalize total variation, you construct like piecewise constant. Now if you put the second derivative, the solution should be piecewise linear, but you know, this is, so that's, uh, <laughs> but uh, th this is hard math, I, I think, okay. Well, maybe not, but uh, at least for me. So maybe we should wrap up because I'm seeing it's running pretty late. Yeah. So let's thank uh, Michael again for this talk. <laughs> Thank you very much for all of you.